Welcome to another episode of Faith Talk, a weekly discussion of issues of faith and life by the pastors of the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd, Pastor Carla Wilson and me, Pastor Mark Russell. Discussion of a new topic is recorded and then released each Thursday this summer on the church's website as well as its Facebook page. Email us with your suggestions for topics. Last week in episode three, we talked about how we as a congregation and as individual Christians are part of a larger church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and locally joined together in mission with Lutherans in the Lower Susquehanna Synod. In case you missed that episode or any of them so far for that matter, it's still available on our website. In this episode to be posted June the 25th, we are joined by Good Shepherd Cantor Chris Prestia, and together we will talk about the participation of LGBTQ persons in the life of the church. And again, thank you for joining us. Certainly the history of LGBTQ people and the church has been problematic, with some Christians using certain biblical texts to condemn homosexuality. And yet to do so is problematic as far as a faithful interpretation of those texts. For when looked at in context, those texts are not addressing consensual same-gender relationships. We're talking about two different things here. Over time, many of us in the church have come to understand that and also have grown in our understanding of sexuality as a complex spectrum of identities and orientations that doesn't flatten out neatly to fit into some cut and dry binary system. Especially through our relationships with LGBTQ people, we've also come to know and appreciate both their faithfulness and the gifts they have to offer. In 2009, our denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA, adopted a social statement on human sexuality that recognized that complexity, as well as the, real, the reality that faithful people within this church hold different perspectives on the issue of homosexuality. The statement opened up the Office of Ministry to LGBTQ people, as well, well as the ability of congregations to call openly gay leaders to serve them. In the 10 years since then, we have grown in our openness to and inclusion of LGBTQ people in the ELCA. One form that has taken here at Good Shepherd is that following a 2014 ruling that made same gender marriage legal in Pennsylvania, we entered into a conversation that led to the revision of our marriage policy to include all couples, gay or straight, whose relationships are recognized by the state. We welcome, affirm, and celebrate the LGBTQ individuals and couples who are part of our congregation. Included among them are our associate pastor, Carla Christopher Wilson, and our cantor, Chris Prestia. Pastor Wilson and cantor Chris, we are blessed to have you with us. But I also know there are many LGBTQ people and allies who wonder how it is that you are part of a church that historically, and in many places still today, has been less than welcoming, to say the least. What's been your experience? How did you come to be a part of the church? Why do you remain in the church? That's a, a weighty series of journey for sure. Um, I actually came to the church because I was brought up in it. Um, the church was my place of comfort and security and safety and family. Um, you know, as a child, before you really understand the complexities of faith, you learn about Jesus' love and care through metaphor. You learn that by experiencing the love of Christians, that the idea of a Christ who loves you, a God who cares for you, um, must look like the people in church that love and care for you, that accept you, by seeing the service um, modeled, the acceptance modeled, the community outreach modeled by church members, that's how I learned what the Bible meant. That's how I learned um, what God meant when God said, this is how we're called to live, and this is how Jesus showed love to people. Um, so everything about the growth of spirituality in my life, um, the, the real centering of faith in everything that I did, it came from watching Christians. It came from the way they took care of my mom and I after, you know, she and my father split up and, you know, they taught her how to cook. They provided childcare. I mean, they showed up 
and supported our family through tough times. And there were times that, you know, having a, a black child at the time that I was, was young was a big deal um, for a white woman to have a, a multiracial child. And when society rejected us, it was the church that embraced us. And when my mother was a divorcee at a time that that was still rather scandalous, um, many people in society rejected us, but it was the church that embraced us. And so I felt strongly that the church was the place that anyone could find a home, could find love and support. And I knew that that's what I believed. Um, that's what I felt called in my spirit was right. And that's who I wanted to be in the world. Um, so that was why the church was, was at my core. And then when I came out, when I was 18, um, and I just, I fell head over heels in love with my judo instructor, my first year of college. Um, I never saw it coming. I did not, you know, have leanings or thoughts when I was younger. Um, it just, you know, and everyone's story is very different. No one LGBTQ person can speak for another, right? We're as different as the rainbow. Um, but for me, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was so confused and unsure how to deal with it. I did what was very logical and natural to me. I went to my church. Um, but at that point in time, uh, the church that I was a part of uh, was not LGBTQ affirming. And they told me that I had a demon inside me, that I was possessed by evil, that I was being seduced by the world, that this was something that need to be, needed to be prayed out of me. And I trusted the church so completely that, and I believe that the church represented acceptance and love of anything that could be accepted and loved. So if my gayness was hated, was deemed as evil, surely the church must be right because they loved me and they would only do what was best for me. And, you know, so I was actually um, sent to a conversion therapy center, um, a conference for sexual healing that was... Um, honestly more traumatic of an experience than I want to even get into in the course of this blog. Um, but I will say that after, you know, less than a week there, I escaped through a window in a snowstorm <laughs> and, you know, called my mom from two states away and God bless her. She drove through this snowstorm and picked me up and brought me home. And I was so traumatized by what I experienced in that place that I left the church that was my heart and my home um, for more than 10 years. Just walking into a church, a congregation, caused anxiety, panic, chest tightening. Um, my, my physical body rejected being in a church space. And of all the pains, the struggles I've experienced in my life, the pain of, of losing the world, it's replaceable. But the pain of losing your afterlife, the pain of losing your eternity, the pain of, of God not loving you, as opposed to just a person not loving you, there's nothing that compares. Just thinking about it now takes my breath away, remembering how devastating that was. And, um, you know, that to me is, is one of the great challenges we have in doing mission and ministry to LGBTQ people, because we don't all understand how much hurt has been done by the church to gay folks and queer folks, and how we have to be so trauma-informed, um, because we're asking them to do something very brave and overcome deep pain um, very possibly when we ask them to come through our doors. Uh, but, you know, I just, I couldn't turn my back on God. And at a certain point, I realized that God never turned, turned their back on me. Um, people are broken and 
make mistakes and are sinful and need to grow. And, you know, the church has never been a perfect place ever. But I realized eventually that the church not being perfect and God not being perfect were not the same thing. And um, that faith that was very personal to me that saved me as a child, it saved me as an adult. And so as I grew in strength and healing and maturity, I said, you know, instead of walking away from the church, I want to re-enter it and help create for other LGBTQ people. And I want to do the work to help the church grow and evolve. Um, I want to be the change and make that space because I do believe that we are all blessed by God and, and meant to be here. And, and so that's why I stay. Chris, what about you? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so um, my, I was also raised in the church um, and uh, I would say my early teenage years is when I began to realize I was gay. And I was in a church that was not affirming. Um, and it was also a church that was very heavily, they heavily preached, this is right, this is wrong. And this is how you get salvation. This is how you lose salvation. It was very focused on um, that, I guess sal salvation is, is what mattered most, as opposed to what I, I've seen at places like Good Shepherd where it's more about healing the world and doing God's work in the world and service, and things like that. So it was, it was just a very different view. Um, I was also, I, I didn't really connect with the communities. I didn't connect with that type of spirituality. So although I was brought up in the church, I did not feel connected in the way that you did when you were young. Um, so when I moved to, th this, was, this was my background in Texas. When I moved to New Jersey with my mom, um, I did not go to church until... I um, applied to be the organist somewhere, <laughs> and uh, and I found a Baptist church. And at that point, my perspective was was very like the Baptist church seemed liberal to me. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is neat. You know, we can do hymns and still have this sort of very evangelical style of preaching, but they're they're not quite as fire and brimstone. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it, but the best I could find sort of in that world was. Um, yeah, homosexuality is still a sin, but we're all sinners. So you're, of course you're welcome here, but there is still, yeah, you're welcome here, but we're all trying to not sin. So you should try not, also try not to sin. Um, so it was, it was welcoming, but not affirming. And, I, you know, I learned there's, there's a difference there. Um, you know, and eventually, I, I guess my story is the, the part that I kept missing in searching for faith community was, was that community aspect. Um, my spirituality, I value, um, I find God in beauty, beautiful things and, you know, not just elaborate, like you think of the cathedrals in Europe, but like even simplicity and, you know, finding God in nature and in a field and things like that. So, but there's um, a sense of, of the quietness and the churches I grew up in were very stimulating and loud and dancing in the aisles and that was certainly very fun <laughs> and I like doing that sometimes <laughs> but um, the places where I did find that type of spirituality I connected with were also pretty conservative. I went to a Catholic undergraduate institution and really connected with Catholic spirituality in a way that was kind of ironic because I was raised to be very anti-Catholic um, and, uh, and I found people my age who had this spirituality and we connected on these wonderful levels and it was the first time I felt connected to a spiritual community, but they believed homosexuality was a sin. And I, you know, I was very open about that with my friends. We kind of agreed that we had different viewpoints and still loved each other and we were, had great relationships. But it, it, after several years, you know, I, I did the whole conversion to Catholicism, got confirmed and it just got exhausting. And I, I you know, um, I had jobs in mainline Protestant churches all the while, so I was well um, well versed in like, Episcopalian and Lutheran traditions that were gay affirming and had uh, spirituality like mine, but there was nobody my age. <laughs> so there's always one piece of the puzzle missing. It became 
kind of difficult. And, um, but ultimately what has kept me in the church is that um, the teachings, they challenge me to be a better person. They challenge me to make the world a better place and, and to heal others. At the same time, the liturgy and worship fills me back up when I'm empty. It, um, and when I have, when I had the, the community like I did at my undergrad, that the community is what strengthens me. Um, I'm still struggling with that because there aren't many people my age at Good Shepherd and uh, not around here in Harrisburg either that, <laughs> have, uh, that are affirming and have this sense of spirituality. But um, so, I, you know, I think those things that have kept me in the church are pretty universal. Um, but uh, th I, I have found it easier to let go of the past and not let that hinder my current experience of church. I'm curious as to what, what either of you would want to say to other LGBTQ people who, you know, sort of look at, looking at the church from the outside and um, concerned, worried. Um, you know, again, I, I appreciate the idea that they, there may be even overcoming a trauma to, to take a, a step through the, through the door. But what would you want to say to them, want them to know from your perspective? So the most amazing thing happened just this morning, um, which was um, the morning that we are filming this is June 15th. And the Supreme Court just released an amazing decision um, saying that LGBTQ people are protected from being fired from their jobs because of their sexual orientation and uh, or their gender. And that is wild to realize that that has not been a protection that we've been offered. I think there are still a lot of folks who are surprised to know that in more than half the states in the country, you could still be fired from your job just for being outed as being gay or being trans. Um, but for LGBTQ people, this is a, a safety, an amount of safety that changes everything. But here's what's overwhelming to me about this victory that, that just happened this morning. This fight has been going on for so long that th there were three original plaintiffs who brought this case that made its way up to the federal Supreme Court. Two of the three plaintiffs died during the, the case going forward. It took so long that the people who started the journey didn't live to see it finished. And when I read that, the first thing I thought about was the story of the Exodus and how when Moses led the people out of slavery and into freedom, that not Moses, not any of the people who left Egypt actually saw the promised land actually got to see the end of the journey. They journeyed because of God's command to build the beautiful kingdom on earth. They traveled out of obedience and they traveled on faith and they traveled in hope. And it's not about everything being perfect. It's about recognizing that sometimes God calls us to something that is bigger than ourselves because there are people down the road who need that. And I want to be very careful in, in placing that burden on LGBTQ people because we have burdens in just getting up every morning and going out into a world that still actively oppresses LGBTQ people in many ways. But for those who feel called, for those who recognize that the church may offer something that the biological family may not, that if your biological family is not supportive, your church family can be. That in a place where there's a lot of economic marginalization, there's a lot of legal lack of support, there's a lot of societal lack of support for LGBTQ people, that the church can be that safe space, that affirming space, that helpful space. There is a lot of gifts that come from being part of a church community and having that, that backup when you don't have hope and when you're struggling on your own, that you can lean on those 
who have that faith, who have that hope, and help them um, to learn and grow while they help lift you up. Um, I would say that there's nothing perfect in this world, but the church has so much promise and so much potential when it gets it right. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And that it's worth it to give yourself that chance for joy um, and to give future generations that chance for joy. Um, we can, if we gave up, this Supreme Court would never have happened. If we gave up, Stonewall would never have happened. Gay marriage would never have happened. I mean, none of these things were instantaneous and none of these things were in place. They all were things we had to fight for. And as a community, LGBTQ people are fierce and resilient and creative and activists by nature. And we can make the world a better place when we don't give up. And so I would just beg my siblings that are out there that if you feel that call, don't give up. Don't give up because God, when, when the church gets it right, when you have the gift of that loving community, it is the most beautiful, holy thing that I've ever experienced. And I, I, want, I want the rainbow tribe that I love to be able to have that chance to know that kind of love and community too. Yeah. Um, wow, well, Pastor Wilson, you really, you really said it. Um, I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking about sort of practical ways to get started. If, um, cause you know, I, I think about even me as a experienced churchgoer, um, I still get nervous when I walk into a new church because it's like social anxiety. Oh my God, everybody is being so friendly. Gosh. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and, and that's me. Imagine somebody who isn't used to liturgical worship, who's not, um, you know, who, who has even more um, past damages than I do. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge step. And right now we have virtual worship where all it, nobody has to see you. Nobody has to know that you're put, sticking your toe in the water. Um, just log in and check it out. Um, and from there, maybe reach out to find, find, start a relationship with one person and they might introduce you to another person. Just little baby steps like that. Going into, even if we were not, um, even if we could safely meet in person, jumping into a Sunday worship service when everyone is there is like diving into the deep end and you don't know how to swim yet. Um, so as much as we talk about worship attendance, worship attendance, I don't think that's the right first step for many people to take. Check things out online, meet a person, meet a second person, maybe talk to the pastor, talk to the cantor. I'm sure he's a nice guy. Um, and yeah, just take your time. That's real. I think that's one of the things that I really want to lift up is, um, you know, the, there's a, a thing that we love to say in the church, all are welcome, right? And to an LGBTQ person, all are welcome is a terrifying phrase because mm -hmm. so many places have used it as a trap. It is like an absolute bait and switch phrase. People say all are welcome because they want you to come in. Like all are welcome. Please come so that we can convert you. All are welcome. Please come so that we can have you in our space to tell you what a sinner you are. All are welcome so that we can invite you in and then tell you you need to live, love, look, behave, and work exactly like us. Um, in short, All Are Welcome has been used by so many people, especially churches, who mean All Are Welcome to come in, but not all are celebrated, not all are affirmed, not all are loved. And so to use generic language is not welcoming and it does not make LGBTQ people feel safe. A specific welcome. 
saying we affirm LGBTQ people in the life of the church. We welcome you into full participation. We celebrate your families, your love, your identity here. Like that language needs to be specific and it needs to be publicly findable. If it's like, oh, well, you know, we don't say anything. We're not a publicly declared congregation in any way. But, you know, when people get to know us, when people are in the church, you know, we treat our gays very well. Um, no, just no, church, no. Um, because you have to have gotten over that threshold to be in the church first. And we don't trust you, church, unfortunately. Um, you have to earn that trust by taking the first step. Vend, have a table at pride festivals. Have a little rainbow flag, have a welcoming statement. Join um, Lutherans Can Become Reconciling in Christ Congregations, which is an official designation for LGBTQ friendly churches. Um, have uh, events during Pride Month, have Bible studies that are for LGBTQ couples. Like, what are we doing that is specifically putting out a findable, visible message that LGBTQ people are welcome? Um, because just like, you know, there's this pushback by people of color um, and Black and Indigenous people saying, you know, don't, don't say all lives matter because right now all lives are not under threat. It's black lives that are under threat. It's indigenous lives, it's immigrant lives, it's Asian lives that are being threatened. Um, when you say all are welcome, what that, that says is we're not willing to name that LGBTQ people are welcome. And if you're not willing to say that publicly, it says something about the real welcome of the church and how safe we really are here. I want to say thank you for being here. Thanks uh, to Pastor Wilson and, and Cantor Chris for being here, meaning being a part of our life and ministry at Good Shepherd Church and also being a part of this conversation today. Um, thanks for sharing your experiences. Uh, thanks for uh, what you bring to us and to the life of the church. And, uh, and to all those who joined us, thanks for being with us for this vlog. Um, yes, we do say it, it is findable. You are welcome and uh, come with us to help heal the world, to come to us, be part of this community. And uh, God loves you and we will hope to do the same. Bless you, peace.